Today's video is the first in the series for simple harmonic motion, or oscillations as our specification calls it. Simple harmonic motion is very much connected with circular motion. And if you haven't watched my video on circular motion, there's a series of them, then I will put a link at the top here to the one that most connects you with simple harmonic motion. And it's like circular motion in that it is periodic. There's a period to it. But instead of being around in a circle, simple harmonic motion is a straight line, like as if you were going across the diameter of a circle. As you can see on the screen, there are two definitions for simple harmonic motion, two ways of telling whether a motion is simple harmonic or not. First of all, if the motion has a constant time period, if it's periodic motion, it's going over and back, and it does that with a constant time period, regardless of whether the amplitude varies, then it is simple harmonic. But the second definition at the bottom is the one that is preferred for examination definitions and the one that really gives us a way of judging whether a motion is simple harmonic or not is this. The acceleration of a body is proportional to the displacement, but in the opposite direction. And of course, acceleration is caused by resultant force, so therefore the resultant force on a body is proportional to its displacement, but in the opposite direction. Now we know, of course, that proportional relationships follow the rule of y equals mx. And in this case, our y value would be force, and our x value is displacement, so still x, and we would say that there's a constant k in there. Now this might look very familiar to you from materials, springs, and in fact, the motion of a body between two springs is the perfect example of simple harmonic motion, but let's remember here that it is opposite direction. So our opposite direction is indicated by the fact that there's a minus. So the equation for the definition of simple harmonic motion is f is equal to minus kx. What this means in real terms is that there's a force pulling the object to the center of the oscillation, away from its maximum displacement. The perfect way of thinking about what is actually happening in simple harmonic motion is to imagine a trolley that has a spring on either end of it, and these are attached to fixed supports. And you pull the trolley over to the right, let's say, and then you let it go, and you watch the trolley oscillate back and forth. When you're thinking about simple harmonic motion, or whether any motion might be simple harmonic, compare it to this idea. Because while there are lots of things that do oscillate, there may be other forces than just the force of the spring involved, and it becomes a little bit more complex. This gives you the perfect way of picturing very straightforward simple harmonic motion. So let's track what happens to this trolley. Conventionally, we know that displacement to the right is positive and displacement to the left is negative, so we're going to stick with that convention. And so suppose you pull it over to the right, like in the direction of this arrow, and then you let it go, and you start your timer, when it's at its maximum displacement to the right. It's going to oscillate back and forth, and we are going to track the displacement with a graph. So you put a displacement time graph. We know at time equals zero, it's at its maximum positive displacement, so we can put a little x up there. As it comes back from that maximum, it's going to pass through the central position, and so that gets an x at displacement equal to zero because this is where the trolley would come to rest when the springs are equally balanced on either side. But of course it doesn't come to rest, it's going to continue over to the other side to reach the next maximum displacement, but this time it's on the left, and of course left is negative. And that just repeats over and over and over again. And if we assume that this is a frictionless surface that the trolley is on, a big assumption, but we can continue on tracking this trolley as it continues to oscillate back and forth. And so we end up with a displacement time graph like that. This is our central position here, which is called the equilibrium position. And that is where our displacement is zero. Now let's look at this trolley again. And instead of tracking its displacement, we're going to look at its velocity. And we're going to look at its velocity for exactly the same time scale. So we put in our axes, and this time they'll be velocity time graphs. And again, we're going to start our t equals zero over here on the right-hand side when you've pulled the trolley over to the maximum distance to the right. At that point, we know that our velocity is going to be zero because it's going to stop 
momentarily over there, even after you let it go and it moves from left to right, right out of the extremes of its motion, it's going to stop momentarily before it reverses. So our velocity at the extremes of the motion is zero. What we need to think about now is where do we go from here? We know that the trolley is going to come back from here and reach its maximum velocity at the equilibrium position in the center, because once it passes that, this spring on the right hand side is going to start slowing it down because it will, will become stretched. So we know it's a maximum velocity at the center, but is it maximum velocity to the right or maximum velocity to the left? And that's what you need to think about. Of course, it's maximum velocity to the left. And again, left is negative. So we're going to put in our maximum velocity there. And once you've done the first one, it becomes fairly self-evident after that. We get zero again at the extreme left. And then we get maximum velocity to the right as it comes back through the central position and so on. And so we end up with that shape of a graph. Let's compare these two graphs. We know from our study of motion graphs before that you can get the velocity from the gradient of the displacement time graph. So if we look at our displacement time graph, it actually makes the plotting of the velocity graph very straightforward if you've already been given. Because of course, if we were to add in our gradients at all points here, we will see it perfectly matches what we've already deduced for our velocity graph. So here, of course, we have a gradient of zero. Here we have our maximum negative gra gradient. Again, a gradient of zero, maximum positive, and so on, exactly matching what we said was the case for our velocity time graph. So there's two ways you can go about producing a velocity time graph. You think about what is happening to the object in motion, or if you're given a displacement time graph, you use the gradients of all of those points. Back we go to our trolley again, and this time we're going to produce an acceleration time graph to see what happens to the acceleration over the exactly the same time period. So again, that's our t equals zero when we've pulled it over to the right hand side. When we've pulled it over to the right hand side, we know that our left hand spring here will be at its maximum stretch. And therefore, it's going to exert its maximum force towards the left. That's going to supply the resultant force and therefore supply the acceleration. So when the trolley is on the right, our maximum leftwards acceleration will be there. And that means maximum negative. When the trolley is in the middle, the springs on either side are balanced, so we have no resultant force, so we'll get no acceleration. And just like before, when the trolley is on the left, the right-hand spring will be at its maximum stretch, maximum resultant force, we'll get maximum right-hand acceleration, and so on. So we end up with another of these graphs. We can also look at the gradients of our velocity time graph, because we know that the gradient of the velocity time graph will give us the acceleration, just like we had before with displacement and velocity. So of course, if you draw in your gradients, very roughly I'm doing it here, but you get the idea, we have maximum negative gradient there, zero gradient there, which matches up with our zero acceleration. We have maximum positive gradient at this point, again, matching up with our maximum acceleration, and so on. So again, depending on what you're given in a question, you could produce an acceleration time graph from a velocity time graph just by looking at the gradients. Let's compare our acceleration time graph with our displacement time graph. And you can see that maximum negative acceleration is maximum positive displacement and zero, zero. So this fits with our original definition of SHM because our original definition of SHM said that acceleration was proportional to displacement, but in the opposite direction. So here we can see that A is proportional to minus X. And if A is proportional to minus X, then F is also proportional to minus X. Because we know that acceleration is proportional to the negative of the displacement or the opposite direction to the displacement, if you're going to plot acceleration against displacement, you are going to get a line that looks like this with a negative gradient passing through the origin. And remember, of course, that you can replace the A here just as easily with force in Newtons and you would get the same graph. In the next video, I am going to do a more detailed comparison between circular motion and simple harmonic motion and look at the equations of simple harmonic motion. We don't need to derive them, but it is helpful if you know how they connect in with circular motion. And you do need to be able to use them, so you need to be confident of what they mean.